then you can execute the trades consistently, right? Yeah. And that's how you can objectively get better as well, because then you can, I implore everyone to do this, by the way, going forwards, open a spreadsheet for the next hundred trades, literally meticulously map everything. What, what was the asset class that I traded? How many lots did I buy or sell that asset? What was my risk? Very important, right? What was the result? What was my net win and loss, right? Do that for the next hundred trades and get really systematic with it. And sit, And by the way, have an additional column at the end where you say, right, did I follow all my processes for that one trade? Yeah. Now, if you say, yes, okay, that's great. You did a great job. Even if it was a loss, that just means, okay, you just, you just misread something wrong. Okay, that's fine. That happens. But if your answer is no, I'm not following all my processes, right? I'm not doing the structural work. I'm not understanding what's going on. I'm not, I'm not marking out my POI correctly and filtering it. I'm not going into my entry protocol, right? Then, you know, the problem is not the system. The problem is with you executing that system. Well, there's nothing wrong with that as well. That's something to just work on, right? But too many people, right? And this is where they go wrong. They get a system, right? And by the way, I've shown our system is pretty effective. And if you look at the results that people like Mikey have had on the team, who took 2K to 100K basically in a few days, you know it works, right? You know people are killing it with it, right? So if, if you are having some struggles with it, you need to take a step back. And I do this too sometimes, right? When I'm having a hard week or a few bad days or whatever, you've got to take a step back. Because it's nothing, I don't at those, that moment think, oh, by the way, let me go and create a completely new system. Of course, we refine things, right? That's where people get twisted with me. They say he's always changing his methodology. They don't realize I'm not changing the methodology. I'm just fine tuning the processes that we have. But when you have a few bad days, you need to be objective and think, actually, the system is not the floor here, right? It's actually my execution of that system. Now, let me take a step back. What's actually going on there? Is it to do with my external environment? Am I stressed? Is there things going on in my life that are affecting my trading? What's going on, right? That could potentially be it, right? Is there an internal mental battle I'm going through, right? Am I looking at everyone on the team make a shit ton of money and I can't seem to hit trades and it's really affecting me, right? Because I know it's working for a lot of people or some people, but it's not working for me. What am I doing wrong? In those moments, you need to take a step back and go back to the processes that are being built. So when the 30 minute time frame over here shifts, we know the bullish pressure is coming in. And because the 30 minute time frame is now aligned with the daily, we can look for a buy. So the next thing when you, so that's step number one, right? Your structural analysis. Number two, your lower time frame matches your higher time frame, right? Great, right? Tick, tick. Right. What am I going to do next? We're going to do the POI. Right. And I just went that with you guys. Right. So when you look at the POI, what are you going to go back? You're going to say, well, Erti or Ali, he said, well, think about the anatomy of an impulse. Right. We've, I've got a bullish impulse here. What am I going to find first? The first thing you mark out is what your flip zone. So if you look over here and I'm not making this up, this is a second chart where I'm showing you this. Right. Second example. What's over here? Right, you've got retail traders are viewing this what as support, 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 support. Sorry, resistance, resistance, resistance. So, where are they looking to take their trade? So, if you put a horizontal line over here, they're looking at this zone over here, right? They're executing those buys somewhere here. And guess what? Price does price comes down and shoots into what that flip zone. Can you see that? Right, and you get a reaction, right? So, if you remember, we took the buys in over here, and that day the end of the Asian session going into London, London did what? London not only took out the liquidity that was built on these Asia lows, it also took out the inducement liquidity of all the retail traders buying at this point over here. Is that making sense? Yeah? Do you guys follow me so far? Any questions about that so far? Yeah, so the POI over here has to be below the what? It has to be below the flip zone. And guess what? You're looking for your order block, right? That's the first thing you do. What's the definition of an order block? The last, what's the definition of a bullish order block? The last sell candle 
before the buying, which took and broke structure, which was that candle. That candle was right here, right? So your POI is not that candle over there, is it? Yeah, I mean, that wouldn't be a bad entry. You would only have a 30 pip stop loss, not bad, right? Because it's an IFC. But if you want to be precise with your definitions, that's your order block. Great. So I've got my major zone, right? And you can write over here, this is my major zone of what? This is my major zone of demand, right? This is your major demand, right? What am I going to do now? Because I have the luxury of the lower time frame. Oops, who's that? Because I have the luxury of the... By the way, guys, feel free. If you, if you are don't have noise around you, feel free to unmute yourself because otherwise it's just more of a lecture. But that's your major demand zone, right? And again, guys, when you do that, if I take this off, trust me, you're looking at this section and being like, where do I take the buys, right? But in order to work that out, you have to have a solid understanding of the definitions of the structures you're trading. Now, a lot of people don't know an order block is the thing that goes and breaks the structure. They just know it's the last sell to buy zone, but then they get confused because they're like, is this the last sell to buy zone? It's not. It's the actual last sell candle, right, which went and broke before the buying happened, which is right here. Yeah, on a higher time frame, it would be this entire zone here. But on a lower time frame, that's refined to this zone. Okay, so we then go on five minute because we have the luxury of time, right? And this is what I did. Okay, so five minute, I'm seeing very something very interesting. You've got your major area of demand in the market, your last sell to buy zone, but we've got an IFC here. Yeah. You guys follow me so far? Now look at this. This is how fractal that concept of the flip zone is, right? On a second's time frame, would you agree to build this five-minute candle? There would have been a bunch of bullish, bullish interactions, right? Look at where that first wick comes into. It comes into support, resistance. It comes into even a fractal version of the thing I'm talking about, which is crazy, right? And guess what? If you refine this zone further, and you could have taken that entry here, right? That's only going to be, uh, how many pip stop losses is this, this point? So our stop loss, if you entered at the major zone, was 18 pips. It's not bad, to be honest, with gold, right? It's pretty good, right? Now it's 10 pips right? Then if you keep refining the zone, you will get to the exact point. So now what are we looking? So we're going in down deeper into our analysis of the lower time frames. And guess what? Now you've got what? If you rewind that zone further, you've cut in the radius of your entry diameter further, okay? At this point, you could even start stop refining it. But it's your job as a trader and analyst to have everything marked. So if you go on two minute time frame, you have a look. And I think the entry over here was one minute. So I'm constantly refining my zone. And by the way, take this with a pinch of salt now. At certain points, if you over refine it, you might not get the entry fill. Okay. That's why it's important to have your major zone marked. Because if you see the if you see a shift happening here on a lower time frame, then you can take a subsequent entry because you know probably it's hit your POI. Okay. Yeah, one minute time frame now, right? Just to show the refinement process because a lot of people are confused about it. So I'm just doing this out of interest, right? Because I want to nail this trade. Okay, now you can probably refine this candle to there. And that's where I took the entry, okay? And you can see that comes and fills it. But the thing, what I'm showing you guys is, right? And what would have been that stop loss? What was that stop loss? Five pips, right? And I gave myself an extra pip of room, six pips. By the way, six pips on gold is very difficult to do. It's not a common occurrence to do because of how volatile it is. But the protocol here is, and going back to the, the checklist over here, right? We've only done a few things so far, right? There's an additional criteria you're going to have to do to filter out your P, um, the entry, right? We're only talking about how do you select the POI. So I'm talking about from the perspective that the market is just broken and 30 and you're looking for where the potential entry is going to happen. I'm not talking about how you've actually entered the market so far. Is that making sense so far, guys, or not? Yes. Yeah. Me, sorry to stop you. I have a question. Now, the yeah. box you marked at this region. Yeah. Up, up, up. No. 
up to that place. Yes, this, um, sorry, yes, um, come down. During this um, Asian period, yeah. during this Asian period, yes, this box that broke it down, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the flip zone. Yes. Can you move up? Uh, I don't know how to get to annotate from here, but I've been able to do that. So if you look at this, right, this section of price action in Asia, in yes, order, that is big. In, or, in this, this, this is just the midline. It's the 50% of this uh, range. Oh, this box. You're talking about this box? Yes, I'm talking about, yes, yes. That box before the break, yes. Yeah, so this, this box, I, just, I think I just drew it as liquidity. It's not, it doesn't really mean much, but... Okay. It's, just, it's just a mark and I was doing at the time, but you could have caught the cells, to be honest, over here, right? All it requires is some thinking, right? And understanding about, again, the anatomy of the impulse, right? So you have an M30 break. And obviously I didn't take the cells, so I'm kind of teaching it of how you would have, you should have thought about this, right? The first thing you have to recognize is that first reaction over here has happened that way. It's happened at the flip zone. So it's not happened at true demand, okay? It's happened at your temporary demand zone, okay? And you ought to recognize there's inducement. If you look at the micro details of this wick, where did this wick hit? It actually created liquidity equal lows. Can everyone see this? Yeah? With that wick here. So you've actually created equal lows, right? You've actually engineered some liquidity, right? The second thing is, obviously when we're talking about an M30 push, there's gonna be lower time frame structure that's made that M30 high, right? This is the external points on M30 now, right? This is the M30 external points, okay? Yeah, so the, if M30 is now external because it's relatively the higher time frame to these lower time frame, at what point do these lower time frames break and you have bearish market sentiment, okay? That you, can, you could have taken the sell. So if you look over here, the three minute time frame is doing what here? bullish isn't it yeah so when this point over here broke you had a shift in m3 market dynamics from bullish to bearish you guys follow me so far yeah can everyone see that right so when you have the shift from m3 bullish to uh, bearish mark, the market dynamics obviously you're coming through the end of asia as well you can look for sales and again guys the first reaction you get here is that where it's at the flip zone because there's, look, the support level's there, isn't it, right? And also, when, and also this is something I noticed with the guys yesterday on the team call. At the flip zone, what will often happen is price will create liquidity. Can you see that? Yeah, we created equal highs. Can everyone appreciate that? Yeah, so at this flip zone as well, did price create liquidity with that wick? Yes, it did. Yeah, and this is a common phenomenon. I only noticed this on the team call with uh, the guys that were on the call yesterday. So that's very important, right? If you, you, I think everyone should write that down, that fact down on their, in their notebooks because it's very important. And now we're talking about entry models and entry execution, right? But we're gonna go back into POI selection in a bit, right? But I just wanna show you this. So we shifted from an M3 bullish to bearish market dynamic. Again, we got another break here. So guess what price does? It creates inducement, comes back and wipes out that liquidity into your POI somewhere here, right? You could have taken it here and put your stop loss there. Still eight pip trade and you get a nice sell off, right? And guess what price shoots for? It shoots for that liquidity below. Yeah. You would have gone on to M1 to, to pick up the shift in dynamics here. But anyway, it shoots for that liquidity below. And now you've got bearish markets Definitely, you got to recognize this. When this breaks, you're no longer in a bullish market. For this time frame, you're back again to bearish. Yeah? And guess what it does? It shoots for that flip zone, and it comes down into your entry point over there. Yeah? Taps it perfectly, right? Guess what? In order to build this impulse, right, you're going to have some sort of lower time frame. So this is your M2 structure point, right? And you've got a structure point here. You just make a higher high, higher low. And that's your subsequent entry right there, right? And it should just rip. Might not hit it. Yeah. And again, see, 
I'm not taking care of my analysis, right? So again, the last block is this one that broke structure here. So that's the one you would mark out. But you could really, really execute down here. But that's just for my network. But let's go back into talking about more ideas about how you select POIs. Everyone clear about what I've just spoken about so far, right? So you did the structural analysis on the higher time frames daily, right? You worked out where your H4 POI was, which was below the flip zone, right? Over here, liquidity void. Then you went on the lower time frame when price hit that POI to see what kind of reaction you get. And was there a shift in market dynamic from bearish to bullish? Okay. And was there a shift? Yes, there was. The 30 minutes shifted. Okay. Then you had to work out in real time where is that POI going to be? So you marked out the flip zone. Okay. And then you worked out refined, you found that major zone on the higher time frame, that major block. And then you found that, refined that to find the actual refined zone, okay? And where the entry came. But you got to accept that sometimes when you over refine, you might miss the entry. So sometimes it's okay to have a slightly wider than accepted or industry stop loss, which everyone's doing at the moment, which is five pips or whatever, right? But you got to accept that because at the end of the day, it's about making money and you know the potential of this trade, right? But there are some more ideas that need to be built here around POIs. Does everyone understand this process so far? Yeah. So number one, higher time frame structure yeah. to get your what? Market sentiment, right? Are you bullish or bearish, right? Should you be a mainly a? Is it is it appropriate to buy if your if the market sentiment is bullish? Is, would that be pro trend or counter trend, right? That's what you're talking about, right? You need to understand that. Number two. When price hits your work out your POI on the higher time frame, POI on HTF, right? Yeah. And that's always the key point is you need to work out the flip zone to work that out. Okay. Yeah. Once you've done that, price is going to hit your POI, right? So POI gets hit. Yeah. And that time you need to assess. Is there been a shift in market dynamics? Because obviously, when price is coming to your POI, it's not in a it's not in an uptrend, is it? Everyone agree with that? Yeah, it's in a down, it's going to be in a downtrend, right? So you need that shift of that structural trend. Okay. Yeah. So look for a shift in that trend, shift in lower time frame, shift in LTF. Sorry about the handwriting, guys. It's kind of hard to write with this pen. But so once you see that, then you need to work out the POI on the lower time frame. Okay. POI on lower time frame. Right. And you know how to do that again. The flip zone as a filter. And then you go even lower to refine. Okay. But that's all well and good. Right. But what are some other characteristics of good POIs? Anyone? Anyone any ideas? Come on, guys. What are some other characteristics of good POIs? Number one, you must break market structure. Number two, you must take liquidity. Yeah, exactly. So you spoke about this yesterday. So all great POIs you should have this criteria. Number one, there has to be liquidity into your POI, right? And what that means is the liquidity can already be there or it might need needed to be engineered around your POI. So around this POI over here, you can see they created equal lows, right? At the flip zone, yeah? And over here as well, and you had liquidity, you had Asia low liquidity into that POI, right? Number two, it has that POI, or well, that block has have had to have led to a BOS. Yeah, BOS, that's the definition of a block, right? And number three is that flip zone. It has to be below the flip zone if you're buying or above the flip zone which you're selling. Guys, focus on this, trust me. If you focus on this, your trading will go to a next level, right? Just by a consequence of doing this, even if your stop loss is a bit wider, you will catch the main expansions. Is that making sense? So for our higher time frame POI. Does it fill those three criteria? Let's have a look. So 
for a higher time frame POI, we're looking at this liquidity void, right? Was there liquidity grabbed into that POI? Well, let's talk about that, right? There's trend line liquidity, there's Asia load liquidity scattered all across here. And they also engineered liquidity at this flip zone and took it through. So does that criteria being fulfilled into our POI? It does, right? So all of this is about, right? You got to think about this, right? Your POI is like a baby, right? Before it can do its work, right? Before it can grow up and be strong and shift the market, it needs to be fed, right? What are the three things that are going to feed it and make this thing able to perform? You guys follow me so far? Yeah? Yeah, it's not the POI, the, this thing at, by itself, without these other things being present, wouldn't be able to do its job, okay? So you need liquidity, you need, you need it to have led to a BOS, right? And it needs to be below the flip zone. Does that make sense? Once those three characteristics are filled, that's a valid POI, yeah? The reason why the IFC didn't give them a sustained move is because it was on the flip zone, right? So it, it, it fulfilled this criteria. It had the liquidity into it. It had it, it might have caught it might have been the cause of the BOS. We don't know, right? But it's on the flip zone. It didn't meet that three criteria. So your baby was growing nicely, right? Your POI, but it couldn't do the job because it couldn't meet that final criteria. Is that making sense, guys, or not? Yeah? Making sense. Making sense. Yeah, makes so, sense. So from a daily um, bias, guys, I'm trying, it's, when you think about it and break up your processes into micro kind of things, and this weekend, by the way, I'm all on the charts all day, and that's why we're going to do another team call tomorrow as well. But I really want us to have these processes written up in our journals, whatever, that when we come to the charts next week, right, we just go through the processes and we follow those processes, right? You're like, okay, I did the structural work on GCAD, right? I know it's bearish for now, and I'll talk about GCAD further. Right, I'm trying to find my POI, okay? Let's, let's, let's go into the page in my diary or wherever notebook and written this and think, how do I find my POI, Okay. What are the three criteria it needs to fulfill for my higher time frame POI? Okay, great. That's done. Let me go lower time frame then, right? Lower time frame, my price is coming into my POI. Stop. I don't need to be emotionally reactive. I need to be emotionally kind of kind of in the middle about everything. I don't, I don't really care. I'm just going to watch price, right? Is there a shift in the lower time frame that it now matches that higher time frame bias? Yeah. Okay, great. I see a shift. Now I need to select my um, my low, lower time frame POI. Yeah. What is the free filtration criteria for that? Is that below the flip zone? Right. Yeah. Have I have I found the right block? Have I found the right zone which led to the BOS? Yeah. Focus on the flip zone first because it will be the major filtration of noise in that impulse. Right. Once I've done that. Okay, price hits my price hits my lower time frame POI. If I'm not confident for it, look, I can watch for another reaction. Yeah, because remember, based on the entry criteria, which I'll go through, this is only an external shift of order flow. Yeah, this is only the external break. The internal breaks right on the POI. And I'll go through that, right? The internal block was broken there, so that's the internal shift. And then you've got the subsequent entry there. You have? Follow me so far, best, right? So it's it has to be a really methodical thing, right? When I think about, yeah. sorry to cut you. Can you go back to the one hour, please? Yes. Um, sure. One minute. One minute. Sorry. One minute. Okay. One minute. One minute. Okay. Now, from from that your entry, yeah. On gold. Yeah. Please, where are the structural points before we can say there's a BOS? Because I see something that I'm confused about. The, on this, the line, yes. I'm I'm thinking your first line. So on this, I'm not I'm not looking at uh, breaks in structure. I'm going yeah. into order flow order flow protocol, right? So your entry protocol. I'm just taught what we just discussed. By the way, is the process of how you find the POI. Okay. POI. okay. Yeah. Now I'm talking about you can enter the market here, but it's the most riskiest entry. Agreed. The reason why mm -hmm. it's the most riskiest entry is because 
when price has gone up over here, it's just grabbed stop losses, right? Stop loss, stop loss, stop loss. So if it's grabbed stop losses, it can take out that low easy the unless you have a shift of order flow on the lower time frame here. That's why you have that entry protocol, right? That's when we're talking about the entry protocol. So when we talk about price, then you've picked out the right POI, prices come into that, you're still not sure if things are going to shift. You can then go into your protocol, right? So as I mentioned over there, that was only an external shift of flow, right? You've only shifted externally. So this is the external leg pullback, and then you've got the internal flow breaking. So this is the last order block, agreed, right? This zone here, right? Which gets broken over here. So once that gets broken, that's your internal shift. Now the entries are looking better. There's more confirmation around that. Is that making sense? Look, it breaks again here, right? That, that block gets broken, yeah? So you've got a subsequent entry here. And then obviously you've got progressive order flow, which you could have caught on any of these blocks here. But that's basically saying if, and the thing is you can take the entry on the first pullback, by the way, you can, right? As long as you've followed the criteria of the higher time frame that I'm talking about. Because if your higher time frame POI is not correct, what's going to happen to price hit? It's going to break through. It's going to. It's just going to continue it's lower, isn't it? Yeah. But if you follow that strict criteria on the higher time frame, you can take the entry here. It's okay. But if, in any case, what your what your thought process should be is actually waiting for the subsequent shifts and order flow on the lower time frame because it confirms it for you even more. Yeah. Quick, quick question. Yeah. Sorry. No okay. Worries. So, um, on so you're on M15 right now. So, you knew you had an indication that uh, it will shift and go higher because you see where your mouse is right now. Well, you just deleted it, but that that first uh, that first break right here, that that shift was an indication that it will go higher. That was a shift that you shifted this because obviously coming down into that that major the H4 um, POI, you've right. got you've got a downtrend, haven't you? So it's just it's an indication that potentially the market is moving bullish. And the thing is, because it was an M M30 shift, it's much more significant than just an M1 shift. Yeah. Right. But normally you shouldn't take the entry on the first pullback. Because for that reason, that price could have just, and this is not a BOS, by the way, it's just a run on liquidity, right? Price could have just raided liquidity, those stop losses here, and just took out those lows. You really, and I took an aggressive entry here, right? The, the point here is if you take an aggressive entry, you need to be aggressive with your risk management. You need to move stop loss to break even pretty quickly, right? But if you then get more confirmation, and I'll go into detail more in a second about the entry protocol, when you have subsequent shifts in flow around that POI, right? So when price comes down and hits your refined zone and you have those subsequent shifts in this internal flow, right? So the internal flow breaks, that is the confirmed entry. Is that making sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. That's the more, com that's the confirmation. So this is the pre-indicator. This sets up that you might be looking for buys basically. This confirms gotcha. the buys, right? The entry protocol should confirm for you that if something is moving in your direction or not, yeah? But this thing should put the thing on your uh, watch list, basically, yeah? That something could be triggering, right? And we'll talk about GJ as well. And for that, I'll recap what we spoke about on GJ because that was a very beautiful entry protocol. Does that make sense? So I only see, and by the way, um, if you look at the progression, and I'll talk about this now. So every, is everyone clear about this criteria? Did everyone write this down on their um, notepad? Did everyone write it now? I might, I might post it later on our team page for everyone to see, right? So when, when I was trying to manage this trade, okay, obviously I have a daily bias that is going to create a new high, but... I'm trying to be sensible with my intraday accounts. And that's why when you, when you guys get to the point where you can have a swing account and an intraday account, it can be beneficial because you can take intraday profits on your intraday accounts. So what I was looking for is, this is obviously M30 structure, right? Or M15, how price progresses through, how structure progresses through time 
is initially you will have an M1 break, then you'll have an M5 break, then you'll have an M15 break, M30, and so on. It's sequential, right? Price doesn't, doesn't just hit a higher time frame POI normally and just break H4, for example, right? It doesn't happen like that. Price is not just going to hit this POI and suddenly you've got a massive candle that takes out a daily structure point, right? So what I marked out next on my chart, and I spoke about this yesterday, is that was the 30-minute time frame. Then I look at where is the H1 structure point, right? So the H1 points, the next H1 points here. So I took my first TP at H1, but then I marked at H4. So once H1 and H4 shifted bullish, then you've got significant sustained pressure now from the buyer side, haven't you, right? Because you've shifted, the buyers have shifted momentum across multiple time frames into these higher time frame slots. Yeah, this over here, by the way, it's just a reaccumulation schematic, right? So this section over here, price was quite tricky. I traded the reversal at the end of the day and you'll be able to do this as well. This is like daily cycle, intraday stuff. But if you look over here, and we put the Asian session indicator on what happened this morning. You had a bunch of liquidity being built up across this area of consolidation. So stop losses on both sides. They essentially, NFP, they slammed the downside. And look, London basically pushed into US, London, US cross. And then you had the expansion, right? From a Wyckoff perspective, this is a reaccumulation schematic because this is the start of a new bullish market cycle. So and also from an Elliott wave perspective, you just had impulse zero to one. So you gotta you gotta bear all these things in mind. Okay. This is impulse zero to one on Elliott wave. Okay. You've just had the start of a bullish market cycle because you wiped out H1, H4 pressure. Now, what the thing was, if you look on the daily's time frame, and, th and this thing was kind of maybe making me doubt that H bias. That thing was making me buy, doubt my biases because on the daily we had just come and filled an imbalance, right? So we, I was thinking because of the liquidity blow, there's a chance that daily pressure could take over. However, the higher time from the overall trend over here of this impulse is that you made a daily higher high. So you've shifted from a bearish market sentiment over here on that higher time frame into that high, into a bullish bias. So if this is, and by the way, this is an unconfirmed higher low yet, we should go and make a higher high at these levels here, okay? And there's a flip zone right here. So it's probably going to happen 1844 or 1851, probably 1851, right? but we'll have to see. So when that happened, I'm assessing price action and what it's telling me on the day. Because the thing is, if this liquidity is not grabbed, we're not really... Um, heading down, right? So we grab liquidity. So from a Wyckoff reaccumulation perspective, it's pretty easy. So you got your buying climax here, right? And if we put the volume on, you should see, can everyone see here? Flat volume, you've got the highest peaking volume here. So that's definitely your buying climax, right? All the way down into your um, uh, automatic rally, right? Then you've got multiple secondary tests, right? Because they're not able to do anything and that creates a consolidation. You've got that creek, which takes out the liquidity. You've got the jump across the creek over here now, right? So when it shoots up over here, let me mark it out. So when it shoots up across here, that's the jump across the creek. And that's the spring phase, test phase. And you've got successive higher highs and higher lows, right? So now the market's in phase D of its reaccumulation schematic. And now it's in trend. Can you see this? Yeah, it's a trend. It's, it's creating a nice higher high and higher low, right? And guess what? If you wanted to catch the entry here again, over here, you could have scaled in and I did on market close. Basically, you have to look at the last sell, sell to buy zone over here, which is that major red zone. And then you just go down the time frames and refine it, right? And you go through that process of entering the market again, the same way. So if you look over here again, you've got what? Resistance, resistance, resistance. So this, this over here is what is your flip zone, right? So number one. Your POI for the main buy is going to become over the flip zone. And I marked out over here, right? Flip zone. So again, look, I'm not making this up. At the flip zone, did they create liquidity? Yes, they did. Yeah, bro, I'm approaching the bit of the week that I don't... Sorry? Hello? 
somebody say something? Can everyone can everyone still hear me? Are you guys still there? Yeah, yeah, we can. yeah, perfect. So does everyone understand that point? By the way, I'm gonna write I've write this point really profoundly and put like um, so, sorry to cut you. This, yeah, this place you marked as the flip zone. Yeah. How come it's a flip zone? Please, can you just quickly break it down? So again, people struggle with this concept, but you just have to, and again, you have to look where retail traders are viewing the market, right? So what's what 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 at this horizontal plane, is there not a support and resistance level? There is, isn't it? One wick, two wick, three rejections. At that area over here, there's obviously resistance, isn't it? Can you see this? So this entire zone is your flip zone, isn't it? Yeah. Is that making sense? Yeah. There's a support and resistance level there, isn't there? Yeah, but it's a, it's a little subjective. Not I really, not really. I mean, that's why support and resistance is subjective, right? It's like which which area of the wick you take. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. When you go on M3, it, it's a little more defined. Yeah. So you're supposed to flick through your time frame and do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no. The idea really is you're supposed to, if you're doing it to a refined level, what you're supposed to do, and you're with the flip zone, you need at least two resistance or support levels, right? You're supposed to take the lowest area, basically, that you see, the resistance and support, and that's that wick there, right? But in real time, when you're trying to see this, all, you're, all you have to know is that this reaction is on that flip zone. Is that making sense? Yeah. yeah. yeah you just, I guess the, also, you can find the flip zone by just looking for the, the order block that broke the previous structure, too. Broke the. I mean, there might not, it, it might not. It might not always be an order block. There, in these examples, there is sometimes there's an imbalance, right? And depending on which time frame you're on, you're not going to see the order block. Is that making sense? Yeah. Okay. But the but the real job really is to find that flip zone. And what I'm really talking about, there will be a cluster of candles spiking resistance and creating a resistance and support level. Yeah. Yeah. Is that making sense? It might, it might appear a subjective thing, but you got to think about it. That's why we stop trading support and resistance, right? Because the problem is when you trade support and resistance, you're like, which level do I take? Do I take this one? Do I take this one? It's a really subjective model, isn't it? And that's why support and resistance traders, they all have different key levels. There's no consistency, is there? Somebody will mark that as a key level. Another person will be marking that, and that as a key level, right? So it becomes really subjective. But the, the real thing is, is you just got to take a rough area where that cluster is. And if price first taps into that zone, you know you're in the flip zone, right? You don't have to refine your flip zone to the nth degree. That's not the point of it because that's not really giving you an entry. But when you see this come here and it creates liquidity, and this is the third example I've shown you guys, you know you're probably in the flip zone, aren't you? Because why would they engineer liquidity if they were just going to shift price? Is that making sense? Yeah. Yeah. So that component here is the FU, and then you can map out your real POI, and it's right there, isn't it? Yeah. And you can see that price comes into it. So that's how you get the scaling entry. But you can't get this entry until you recognize what the clues in price action are. And guys, by the way, let me show you this. Right. You can use this in your analysis from a higher time frame. It's not something I've discussed recently, but if you look at it and it goes to kind of an Elliott wave. It might be subjective for you, right? But you're essentially looking for roughly five drives. Sometimes there might be six into an expansion or a, a, a compression down, right? So if you look over here, this was drive one. Let me get the Elliott wave to work, uh, actually. Let me do this. So, uh, so you got one, you got two, you got three, you got four, and you got the fifth drive. Have you not? Yeah, roughly right? You've got five considerable significant drives into your POI. When that often happens, you have a reversal, right? So the car, basically, they use this in their teachings, right? Essentially, they look for a five drive into a high to look for a distribution or a five drive into the low to look for an accumulation, because that's when the market, market from a market cycle perspective, things start to shift in the opposite side. 
Okay. Now I'm not saying you just look at this, right? But it could be an additional clue for you when things are exhausting. This one was more subjective on this side. So you had like one, two, three, four, and five, or four, five, six. It's normally five or six drives. You guys follow me so far? But is anyone, is there, if anyone's better at Elliott Wave, they can say it. it's not my strength, but you can use that thing as well. So if you know you're at the start of another bullish market cycle because you've now started shifting H1 and H4, you've got this, re, you're most likely going to get a reaccumulation. Also, another thing I looked at, right, is that if you look at the strength of this break over here, you can see it's a pretty full break. So there was a lot of momentum as it was wiping out H1 structure that normally implies that the liquidity point for this move has been filled and they're not going to give you a deep pullback. If there was a significant, and I mean, this did break it with a wick, right? But on higher time frame, let's have a look. But I mean, that wicking through action basically was because of the Asia high over here, but this is a very strong move. Like it's a very strong candle, H4 candle pushing through. So you definitely know you're not going to get a deep pullback, but in any case you might have. So you have to look at the story that's building on the lower time frames here. Does that make sense so far, guys? Yeah. Also, the only liquidity pool was these equal lows. I mean, it can be a magnet because you don't know how many stop losses are sitting here. But if you think from an entry perspective, how many people would have got this entry on gold at 1722? I don't know. I don't have the statistics for it, right? But I don't think it would have been that many. Yeah, because the banks, when they do a very exaggerated move like this, they normally do it when there aren't that many people because they only want to be the ones getting the orders in, right? So that's what's going on. So if you look from another bias perspective, right? And we're talking about building processes. Should we do GCAD first or should we talk about dollar index? What do you guys want to do? What do you guys want to do? Should we talk about GCAD or dollar index? It's up to you guys. About dollar index. Dollar dollar index. index. Okay, so another thing that was that's supporting the bias of a bullish gold run, expanded bullish gold run, right? So if you look over here on a higher time frame, right? We had a market that was pushing up, right? So this is the structure point over here, right? We pushed up to make this high. When this broke down over here, we've shifted from now a bullish market dynamic into what? A bearish market dynamic, right? So we just created a lower high, okay? And obviously internally, we've got a nice, uptrending market to create this lower high point when this broke down here that confirmed the continuation of that bearish market and we started making lower highs and internal lower highs and lower lows right so clearly from a higher time where what where, where, where is dollar index at the moment it's bearish isn't it overall right we're in a bearish market environment however when it came down over here what's it done it went into an internal eight hour bullish market environment it engineered some liquidity over here, snapped through, there was equal high sitting over here. And again, guys, if, if that previous example was more subjective, right, this example is more objective for you guys because you should see, be able to see, would retail traders not see that as support, those three wicks sitting there? Can everyone see this? Yeah? It's a zone, isn't it, right? They'll be looking at a zone. So most retail traders that trade support resistance, they mark out a zone. So You've got a zone of wicks over here, which are support, resistance, resistance. And that's the flip zone, isn't it? So now what has price done? And again, the flip zone, does it create liquidity? Yes, it does. So when price pushes up into the flip zone, it made relatively equal highs over here. Can everyone see this? Yeah. Made relatively equal highs also with that wick over there. So it created liquidity. So if you're trying to find your POI for where the sell is going to come on dollar index because you realize you're in a bearish market cycle, right? What are your criteria into your POI? So let's recap your criteria. So criteria number one, you're going to have to have liquidity into your POI. Did we have liquidity into our POI? Yes, we did. So on low time frame, this wick was framed up against another structure over here. That's why I marked it. So, and you had some liquidity here. So you've got liquidity. Also, you had trend line liquidity right here. So you have three types of liquidity sitting there. 
There was an Asia high sitting here as well. So there was a fourth type. So was there liquidity into your POI? Yes, there was. Okay, that's fulfilled. Number two, have you selected the correct major zone because it led to a BOS? Well, the last buy to sell zone is this blue candle here that led to that BOS. So that's selected. In terms of lower time frame refinement, you then have to go into your lower time frame zone and you find the IFC that it's tapped or that imbalance that it's come to, right? And then you see on a lower time frame what price is doing as it's approaching your POI. Okay. So, and this comes going to your confirmation model, right? So, as price is coming into your POI, it's engineered liquidity here. Again, there's equal highs, there's a box of consolidation. Anytime there's boxes of consolidation, just, just like the Asia session range, and we haven't gone into it, is a box of consolidation. Anytime price creates a box of consolidation, you know there's going to be buy stops and sell stops on either sides, and it's a potential um, it's a potential target of liquidity. And guess what they did? They slammed the top side liquidity, and then they tap the bottom side liquidity. So now you've probably made the the true high of that entire impulse because the liquidity factor has been fulfilled. And also the last criteria on the high time frame was that it was above the flips and that was, so that was fulfilled, right? Now you can go into your protocol, right? So what is all of this? So when on a lower time frame, if we go lower time frame and we break this down for you guys, and you see this over here, you've got price mitigating this block and everyone see that, right? You got to mark out the last sell to buy zone, right? Over here. So it's mitigation happening, right? Or IFC is being mitigated. So when price pushes down over here, when price breaks this over here that's your external break of order flow yeah that's the external break of order flow right so price is coming down sweeping all of these stop losses sitting across here what does it do it pushes up here grabs that trend line liquidity right and guess what does it shift the order flow again yes it does so over here you've got a shift in order flow because that block the ifc block gets broken so that's the internal flow right there yeah price breaks that so that's the external break internal break pushes up here it's failing to break these highs they have run downside liquidity twice right they've shot if they've run down downside liquidity twice and they're unable to shift these highs so what's that telling you about the momentum on the opposite side pressure is coming in right and guess what it comes into your and i haven't discussed this level with you guys right this is a very important level in the market, right? When you see a formation like this, um, let me make this. Some of those entries you see are based on these POIs here, right? When you see a, when you see an FU candle, you can measure it. It's probably around 50% that it's come to, right? But often where you want to focus your markings on, uh, yeah, comes, okay, so that was 50%. The reason why it comes to that level, and I prefer that over marking just 50% when you see these two wicks in formation is because this is what you they call this is a quasi modo QML level on a fractal time frame and everyone knows about QML you have the left shoulder head and right shoulder what people don't understand is you get QML fractally happening so that's why price taps into it it's to do with the symmetry in the market but in any case you have the external break you have the internal break and then you have the final break in order flow here right there on these blocks here right so when that breaks you know dixie's going down and guess what happens you shifted and guess what you shifted from a bullish market dynamic into what are you in a bearish market dynamic now yes you are right yeah you shifted over here actually sorry you've already shifted yeah but you've definitely shifted that if you weren't sure about this shift that's for whatever reason you definitely shifted is that making sense? That's why I'm focusing on structure with you guys so much, right? Because the thing is, if you understand how to read structure properly, you can read when markets shift on each time frame based on the, the uh, relative time frame between the higher and the relative lower time frame, whether you are in now turning bullish and bearish. This is 10 minute, by the way. So you've got a 10 minute shift from a bullish dynamic to a bearish dynamic, which is significant. Right. And that's why the entry protocol is not based on structure, it's based on order flow. Order flow often pre, pre indicates a shift in momentum. You guys follow me so far? Or not? Yes, yeah. Any questions about that, guys? I know we're going very fast, but 
Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no question. Um, yeah, sorry, so, so, sorry to cut you. Sorry. Just this suggestion, yeah. because I know there are a lot of concepts that we speak about on uh, what's it called on a team calls like that. Now, can we just work out structures throughout the day? Structures. You want to just talk about structure, right? Yes. Yeah. Let's just talk about structures. Uh, uh, that's why I did GCAD and I was going to go through it. And But our, our discussion took a different way. But I hope everyone's happy now, right? Just to summarize, you should all be able to refine your POIs because, as I said, if you want to make your POI very specific, right, you have to have a specific protocol in place to do so. Okay. Yeah. So number one, you need to have a criteria for higher time frame POIs and how you refine lower time frame POIs, right? It's both the same criteria. If you think about it, it's the exact same criteria. You have to apply on both. So higher time frame, the first one is major one. You have to have liquidity being grabbed into your POI just to summarize. It. And everyone can write this down or take a screenshot, I don't mind, whatever. Two, that POI should have led to a BOS. But that implies is that you've selected the correct order block or the last sell to buy zone or the last buy to sell zone. Okay. Three, and this is probably what you should try and find first is the flip zone. It has to be below the flip zone for buying and above the flip zone for sell. Yeah, it's very important. This will be the greatest filter because the thing is, liquidity doesn't filter your PY. Yeah. This does not fit, this filters it slightly, but this filters it completely. Okay. The same, and I showed you that entry on um, gold, the lower time frame is the same, right? On that scaling second entry over here, right? We talk, we, we did how we filtered down on the POI over here, right? Look, without those criteria, this is a very tricky section. You might be taking trades here, 1760, because you see an IFC. You might take it the imbalance, right? But you, the point here is you really want to understand what is the true cause of the moves, okay? And you really, you really want to find those demand zones, supply and demand zones, okay? So is that making sense to everyone so far? That's the POI, right? That really shouldn't scare you anymore. Like no one on the team should be scared what's going on. Nobody should be scared of the POI problem anymore because it should be self-explanatory, right? So over here, just to recap, we are, we're in bearish market. We shifted into a bullish market dynamic. Then we shifted back bearish, but we had just printed a monthly higher high, which was unconfirmed. That's created a monthly higher low. And at this point over here, we were talking, we still had weekly internal structure over here, weekly lower high, weekly lower, um, weekly lower high, which then obviously got wiped out. So the market wiped out this internal pressure and now you're in a bullish market dynamic, right? So market came down and guess what? You, you put on a lower time frame, you got a flip zone there, engineered liquidity into that liquidity void, you created a weekly higher low. So these are your external reference points. Internally, you're making die daily higher highs and higher lows. So what? Create the next weekly higher high. And you can see I've marked out those external points in the circles with those um, with, the, with the outline to it. So these are your external reference point now. So monthly is now bullish, yeah? Weekly is now bullish, right? See how we're building a story here. So when this, when this made a weekly higher high, what should happen to this low? If we're gonna continue the bullish trend. Create a weekly higher low, right? It shouldn't take out this low. So was this low? Was this low protected? Yes, it was. So we came back down, right? And again, look over here, guys. Importance of this. You have some sort of resistance level here, right? Over here. That's the flip zone, okay? So over here, you had liquidity grabbed, liquidity engineered equal lows over here on a lower time frame into your POI over here. So your true POI that you need to refine is this IFC. This is the only one. Yeah, for this weekly POI, right? So weekly is now bullish, okay? However, if you look at current price action over here, we are consolidating at the moment, right? We are in a consolidation zone. We haven't really, we haven't really gone on to, um, we haven't really gone on 
to um, we, we, we need to go and print a new weekly higher height based on what the weekly is saying, right? However, at the moment, if you look over here, what's happening over here? So you've got external landmark here. You're making an internal bullish trend over here. Can everyone see this? Yeah. The breakdown, the, the, the shift from here to here, which then shifted that pressure that made that weekly higher low implies we're now going to get a continuation of that uptrend because if this thing did not break over here, what that would mean is price has come up here, over here, it's respected that supply zone. And guess what? Internally, we're still bearish and we're pushing potentially to grab this liquidity that's sitting here. Is that making sense? Yeah, because it would be a lower high, expecting a lower low. Yeah, that's not happened. What's actually happened is we've actually gone on to wipe out the internal trend, which was making that higher low, and we've made an internal higher high, based relatively to the weekly. Obviously, on the daily, this is external structure, right? It's external structure for the daily. So when it came over here, it then came and wiped out this this landmark significant landmark on the daily time frame so now our daily has shifted from bullish to bearish so note now weekly is bullish monthly is bullish daily has just shifted bearish so the two the important reference points now are this this one this one right because these are your daily external points so price has basically been trading within those two points of reference right and we are bearish so when price has come up over here What's it done is grab liquidity and it's made a daily lower high. Yeah. And then we go on the A tower and I've marked this over here to show you guys. So in order to make that, that daily lower high over here, and let's put this in red daily. Okay. So I'm not doing it. So, yeah. So you made that daily lower high over here, right? Uh, daily lower high. In order to make that daily lower high, You've got eight hour bullish by these kind of things over here, bullish higher highs and higher lows, creating that uh, um, eight hour higher high, which is obviously on the daily a lower high. And we know the daily is bearish because we shifted here. Then what happens? Market breaks down that important external point on the eight hour, right? So the market was bullish here. So now eight hour is bearish. So what is the story right now? So we got monthly. Let me put this in green, bullish. Yeah, we got weekly bullish. We got our daily time frame, which is bearish. Yeah, and we got our eight hour, which is bearish, aren't we? Right. So there's there's a mixing between the higher time frame and lower time frame. Right. We can only go back up once what these higher time frames start synchronizing with the lower time frame. Also important to note, right? When we've on the weekly time frame, this thing decides to load. So let's go weekly here. Maybe this thing loads. Uh, right. So on the weekly time frame, and I'm and I've written this here, right? So if you mark out the impulse from here to here, right, you've only had a seventy percent retracement. Yeah. Everyone see that? We haven't come into those deeper levels, right? And obviously, price can still do that, right? Because we haven't really broken broken this here. Clearly, we shifted bearish over here and daily and eight hours shifted bearish. So what's going on on this more immediate section of price action? So you can start framing some trade ideas, right? So if this decides to load. So we shifted bearish over here. We're creating eight hour lower highs and lower lows, right? We came up to here, and guess what we did? We engineered some liquidity over here. Internally, we were bullish. And on this is probably four hour trend now that we're talking about. So four hour was bullish, right? And guess what it did? It came into this POI, snapped all this liquidity across here, but the eight hour time frame is still bearish, right? It's just all it's done is created a lower high into a higher zone because on the eight hour, this is external structure. Right. These are external landmarks, right? They have not been wiped out. So the eight hour pressure is being maintained, right? That push up on the four hour, which was bullish. Yeah, four hour was bullish, right? Could not wipe out eight hour pressure. It's still bearish. Agreed? Yeah. So again, let me write this down. Weekly 
bullish, monthly bullish, eight hour bearish, four hour here was bullish, right? Agreed? But it could not shift that eight hour pressure. Yeah, also daily was uh, bearish, right? Could not shift that, uh, that eight hour pressure. So what have we got now? If you look over here, we had on the four hour, a nice uptrend. When we broke down, we created a lower high over here and break this down. We've now shifted the four hour from a bullish market into a bearish market. So which side of the market should we be on at the moment? Currently, we should be on the bear side of the market, right? So you've got to recognize now any trade that if you do take it here is counter trend to the continuation eight hour plays. Is that making sense so far? Might have gone through that too quickly. Let me know if I did. Did I go through that too quickly or not? Anyone? Um, what was that? Sorry, guys. Can you come again? Can you recap on that? The whole thing or which part? Not the whole thing. This place that you said that. So we, we, we all agree, right? Monthly, monthly is bullish, right? Because monthly made a high and higher low, right? And then we're working out the story of the weekly, right? So the weekly story is what? So monthly is bullish. Oh, this thing gonna slow. Sometime trading we does this. I don't know why. Uh, okay, so yeah, so weekly, monthly we agree is bullish. Weekly is bullish because we're making higher highs and higher lows. However, price at the moment here is in some sort of consolidation, but you need to work out how the different time frames are in trend, right? So then we're looking at the, how can I teach what this thing doesn't want to do? Yeah, so then we're talking, looking about the daily, right? So in order to try and shift, so in order to, so, when we were we made these weekly structure points over here, the trend on the daily was obviously bullish to try and make that next weekly high. However, you can't you can't just make another weekly high before you shift the pressure, the downward pressure that made this weekly higher low. So the first step is you shift the previous trend, which we did right over here, which suggests we're going to have a continuation of that weekly trend. The only question now is. Is that, is that point over there, the higher low to continue higher, right? Or if it is it like this? So the question here is, is that point the higher low? Because it is a 70 retracement for this entire impulse, enough to take it higher, or is the market in a complex pullback and it wants to come into lower zones, right? And then rip up. Is that making sense? Yeah. Yes. Is that clear so far or not? Right. So, so you've got the wiping out of that previous trend, which indicates more continuation. And then you, you're thinking about the two possibilities. So we need to work out which possibility are we in. So when we look at that now, we look at it here, the daily, the daily uh, market bias shifted from bullish to bearish when we wiped out that daily structure. So now monthly, Again, you've got to track this, right? Monthly is bullish. Weekly is bullish. Daily is what? Bearish, isn't it? Everyone agree with that? Yeah? Everyone agree that daily is bearish? Because we've broken that daily structure point? Yeah? So daily is bearish. Then we've got to look at what the medium-term time frames are doing, right? So in order to create these daily structure points, obviously there's going to be an interaction of lower time frames. So... When we pushed up here, you've got eight hour bullish pressure. However, that cannot shift that, it cannot shift that bearish pressure, right? So we didn't have a breakdown of the day eight hour structure. And so eight hour was bullish over here, and now it became bearish. So we got eight hour in a bearish time frames as well, right? And then we look at four hour. This thing is so slow. <laughs> Yeah, so we were talking about, yeah, so eight hours became bearish. 
these are the HR external external points over here, right? This was the impulse that led to the break of all of this, right? So that's it. We came up here with four. When we came up here with four hour structure, we could not shift that high. And therefore, what happened to that four hour structure? Well, that four hour structure did what? It made, it respected that, uh, it respected structure over here, right? It, it respected that structural point over there. And guess what? It should have cleared that high. However, it didn't do that. All it did was make a lower high. Everyone see this? Yeah. So you just created a four hour lower high. And then that four hour lower high did what? It went on to break that eight hour point of structure. And therefore you now have four hour being bearish. And as a result of this, now you're looking for a retracement up into this zone. So we're looking for, we're gonna counter trend trade the buys into some zone over here, create the next lower high because four hour is bearish to continue lower. And that's the eight hour, four hour and daily being bearish are telling you that price wants to head to lower zones on that weekly structure. Is that making sense? Because the weekly points are here. Yeah, the weekly points are here. But this section of price action is implying to you that we want to retrace, potentially counter trend into bearish continuation. Is that making sense to everyone or not? Does that make sense to everyone? Yes, it's making sense. See how tricky that is, right? I'm not, I'm not saying this lightly, right? But structure analysis is so complicated because of the interaction of the different time frames. And you and this section took me a lot of thinking to figure out because is the, the structures become so mixed on different time frames, right? But you gotta go in through a sequence and work out what your each major time frames are doing. So now if I'm looking for a counter trend trade, right? Again, I'm looking on my eight hour and I'm going through those principles where the buyers could come, right? So principle number one, I want, uh, so let's focus on the main one, right? I wanna find the flip zone first and mark it out because at the flip zone, everything above the flip zone is, is not, in, it, it doesn't matter for me, right? It's just whatever, right? So if you look over here, I see, look, support, you see now I'm on a support level, support level, resistance, resistance, but this area takes my focus, right? So at the immediate last sell to buy zone, you've got resistance, resistance. It fits the criteria of a base because it's two zones, right? So this zone over here was your reaction at the flip zone. And guess what? Did it create liquidity? Yes, it did. So if you look over there, you've got equal lows being built right here. Can you see this? Which is a characteristic of price when price taps into the flip zone. Yeah, you've got trend line liquidity over here. And guess what? Price has shot through that, right? So does that fill that criteria? So I need to focus in on the last sell to buy zone. It can't be anything here. The last sell to buy zone is here, right? And then when we refine this lower, so that's your major area of um, supply in the market, right? You can see, you again can refine it into that last sell to buy zone right here and price is already tapped into it, right? So what do we need to know about when price is tapping into, um, so have we filled all our criteria? Yeah, we did, so we did. So we got uh, liquidity into POI. We had the, the um, POI, which led to the BOS to the top side. And then we also had it going below the flip zone. So. Now we're talking about actually looking at what happens to price as it's hitting our POI. So there's the same thing, right? What I spoke about. So criteria number one, right? This is your confirmation model. So when price is hitting the POI, it needs to have what? It needs to have liquidity into POI. Did they do that? They all well, they did. They engineered this box of consolidation. Can everyone see this? Yeah. Yeah. They engineered this box of consolidation. So that's equal lows liquidity into your POI. Perfect, right? Now you've got what? You've got a shift in market structure, right? And whatever you got, you've got a one hour shift. Everyone agree with that? Yeah. So if you've got a one hour shift, what are you looking for now? One hour is now bullish. Yeah. So you had daily bearish, eight hour bearish, four hour bearish over here you had one hour bearish and now we've just shifted 
from bearish to bullish. So what am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for my entry for the buys, right? Because we made a one hour higher high. So in order to do that, you go into the protocol again. So again, flip zone is right here. Yeah, that's your flip zone right there, right? First time back into it. So all of this is going to be liquidity. Yeah, into that zone. And then you've got your POI right here. It's a much simpler one. That's the zone you need to focus in for your entry. You guys follow me so far? So even now, you can probably take a counter trend here, trade error 6.5 because it's shifted internally this um, structure here. Yeah, so you shifted from a bull M30 market to a bear market. You should be looking for sales here, right? Price comes here, you should be looking for a sell. Let me tidy this up. Are you guys still with me or not? Yes, you're following. If I'm going too fast, just slow me down because I'm getting a little tired to be honest right now. But yeah, so right now we know we want to take the main buys here, right? I'm looking for some sort. I'm going to do a gross like reward model here. But you want to look, you want to look for, this is going to be our main buy over here, right? And we're targeting up here because we're counter trend trading that structure into some point over here, right? But I'm saying you can take a sell here. Yeah, you could take a sell here. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm sure. That, yeah, exactly. The flip zone will help. So forget, forget this trade for now, right? If we're talking about this trade here, right? I mean, look, it's already going to be a ridiculous risk reward, right? Because you understand the structure first, everything else is secondary, right? Then if you're working out, because remember now, monthly is bullish, just to recap, weekly is bullish, daily is bearish, eight hour is bearish, four hour is bearish, but our one hour is now bullish, right? So what do we, where are we going to target this, right? So look, remember, your flip zone is going to get hit, isn't it, right? So your first target could even be at the flip zone. Is that making sense? Yeah. Your first target TP could be here, right? Remember, this is one hour progression. Four hour structure is here, right? So these four hour points are going to get hit. But actually, if you really want to hold this swing, it's really, it's going to target that Asia high and it's going to reach for this two hour POI over here. And that's where the sell off is going to happen because that's the entire flip zone there. Yeah. So initially, I thought this was a valid POI. But if you look over here, there's Asia highs aren't there? So can that ever be a POI? No. So you probably want to TP here. Yeah. Does that make sense? Or at just that Asia high. And guess what? That becomes a nice trade. And you'll be able to refine this further because at the moment, remember, this is only an external break of order flow. Price needs to come down here into your POI and shift again. Yeah, you'll be able to get a much tighter execution model, but it's already a 25 to one and you've got 500 pit move. Yeah, when it comes over there, now you are what? You are bearish on the four hours. So what do you need to do? Because remember, we shifted to eight hour bearish market. So what do we need to do? We need to sell the thing, right? So that's where you're going to look for sales. I'm going to do this quite crudely, but that's where you're going to look to sell. Yeah, does that make sense? And you're going to target some lower level. Probably that structure point there. Yeah. Does that all make sense, guys? It's, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very confusing bit of price action, to be honest so with you. with this explanation that you've explained. And guess what? We probably will head to these lower zones because there's trend line liquidity. Like this is all liquidity now. One point six three. Something that's more. More informative whereby we have something to work on. We now have an assignment now that we're going to be working on major structure. Thank you very much for yes, yeah, yeah. So everyone, right? And guys, pick a random chart. I don't trade pound cad. I never I'm never I mean I've traded a few times in my life, but it's not my regular pair. But the thing is, you need to be able to practice on concepts on pairs you don't trade. It's the only way to get better at understanding structure. Yeah. I'm sorry, can I divert, please? I don't know. Can, can we check Bitcoin? Bitcoin, I did the analysis. It's going long. It's, it's a buy based on structure as well. I'll look at it for you guys now. But where's this thing? Yeah, Bitcoin is a buy. Yeah, 
Yeah. Remember we took buys here last week. Yeah. It's so, because, so, it's so are, we, are we expecting of more longs than short? Because I was thinking the mm -hmm. episode should hold. No, we're not anymore because look, you got to study the structure, right? So if you look at eight hour over here, um, so this was eight hour structure, right? You are making, if I highlight this, so you made a high and then you broke across here, right? You broke across structures here. So you made a lower high, lower low, right? Even here, lower high. Yeah, I think that was one push, lower high, lower low. So then you came over here, lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low. And then when this pushed up here, you have wiped out that eight hour pressure. So you are you in a bearish market or a bullish market now? We are bullish. Yeah, we're in a bullish market currently, right? So all this is now, this retracement should have happened because again, look where it came to. It came to the flip. It's come to the flip zone, hasn't it? Right? Yeah. And all of, all of this is trend line liquidity. I spoke about this. We came into structure. We came into an important block of structure. So we literally tapped. We kind of just tapped above. I mean, it is that block. It's that entire block. So we tapped into that block. Then you had the shift happening on the lower time frame. So this is a buy. And this is going to break this liquidity here easily. Where do you think it's going next? It's going to this zone here, right? This last buy to zone here. Once you understand structure, guys, honestly, trading, you, the understanding of where things are going is going to become simplified. Now, look, Bitcoin wasn't as complicated to work out as pound CAD. Some of these pairs are very complicated because the lower and higher time frames are mixing dramatically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Whereas Bitcoin is sim in simplistic. You can see, okay, we. we um, on, 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 um, I, I made a mistake in my analysis. I was thinking we are still. Uh, bearish on the weekly time frame on the mm -hmm. weekly time frame i don't know if you can look at it from the weekly perspective. I mean, you can already see right i mean the higher time frame is going to show this right that's what the last break was right so when bitcoin shot up that was the entire expansion all it did was come back into structure it never broke the structure can you see that it never broke its higher low yeah. wow you never broke its higher low. So over here, we were in a bullish market, right? Where we turned bearish was right here. Can you see this? It's so, it's so important to know when things are bullish and then they're shifting into a bearish market environment. It's so, so important. If you can do that, then you can work out the direction. So that we're still bullish on the weekly, basically. Oh, I was already seeing my weekly as being bearish. That, that's why structure is very important in everything we do. Mm. 